All right. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Cox. I'm one of the Instat uh, North American account managers that's dedicated to soccer uh, or football. Uh, today, I have a very special guest from James Madison University. He's the director of analytics and video. I have Micah Pomo. Mike, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Doing great. So today, folks, we're going to kind of walk you through uh, how Michael is using Instat, uh, our API data, and he's going to walk us through his presentation and show how he takes the data that we compile here at Instat uh, and transfers it over and uses this as a learning mechanism for the players at JMU. So, uh, but Mike, just let's give these folks uh, that are joining us here a quick background. Uh, tell us a little about yourself how your things are going at JMU, and can you tell us why you chose to work with analytics? Yeah, I started working in analytics probably early on. I started coaching from a younger age when I was around 16, and then started implementing some uses of data um, inside while working within youth football. And then from there, that was just basic tracking of shots and other things that would go towards, you know, my principles of play with the team. And then from there, um, I really started to learn more of what an analyst does within soccer. And then I joined JMU when I was a sophomore uh, in school. And then when our new coaching staff came in, my role really kind of took off from there. And then just started uh, doing lots of different video analysis and then data to aid what we're doing in other, in, uh, in other factors with the team. And uh, really, I just use analytics as a way to aid decision making for the coaches and the players and a way just to uh, improve all the processes without, with, uh, throughout the program. That's amazing. So, it, and you started coaching at 16, so you uh, have a few years underneath your belt. How has the development of the data transpired over the years of you coaching? Yeah, I mean, it moved from simple, you know, note taking on, you know, simple notebook of shots that are taken. And then, um, well, from there, I also had an implementation of expected goals through an Excel spreadsheet I made just through linking formulas within the spreadsheet. And then um, I think really when I started learning more about um, using Python and programming languages, uh, transpired when more people started opening up data to the public. Um, I think it was around the 2018 World Cup when I started playing around with those. And then from there, that's really when I learned how to, how to best use data um, and work with coaches and to kind of put it in kind of their language, which I also have back on it because I've been coaching for a while. Excellent. And then, I mean, transpired to today's world, you're obviously using Instat. Um, and we provide you with the raw API data. Uh, how do you like using Instat for this data? Yeah, Instat's great. They're the, um, the major supplier of, you know, college soccer, um, especially on the women's side. So it's nice to be able to just log on and pull video off of any team I need to go analyze or just want to do it for fun. And the same side of that, I get the, um, get access to the full data set from every team in the country. So it's just simple pulling the data into, uh, and putting it into my database. And then from there, I can access anything that I want to explore in any team in the country. So it's amazing usage of either looking at our team, our team, we're looking through oppositional analysis, or even sometimes I get a text through a coach saying, let's look at this girl who just won the transfer portal and I can pull up a quick report in seconds for him. Absolutely. I mean, that, that speaks volumes uh, to our Instat platform. And just want to touch that, you know, division one soccer like you guys are uh you know we use the same the same data is available for you know academies um, all the way up to the professional leagues as well uh, but i mean what benefits does instat have that makes your job that much easier yeah it's great to be able to house you know the kind of the the video we need in one place so it's just you know signing on and pulling the video same thing with the data as well and it's also nice to get us access into um like scouting, um, you know, other international recruits potentially that we might want to bring to the program where, where they have, you know, a big database of players playing in Europe that we can go look at and see if they might fit into what we're looking to bring into the program. Yep. Which is all housed. I mean, once you see the transfer pool, you know, you're obviously able to come over and uh, come on an, our Instat platform and, and use our international scouting tool uh, to help find that player. And then you can take that data and kind of, you know, run your, uh, terminology and get them be able to see all that data on them. So that's great. So without further ado, uh, why don't we get into how you take our data um, and use it at JMU? So, yeah, thanks, Dave. I'm just going to start sharing my screen.
So throughout this presentation, I'm just going to walk through kind of an overview of what my workflow is like uh, with JMU, what I do with the data, which then contains examples of models and visualizations that if you've seen my Twitter page, you will have a little bit of background as, with also some implementation of how I, um, practical examples of what I do from this data, which includes past clustering and phases of play. So what my workflow is. So in match, where I'm capturing the match live and coding it within um, sports code according to our principles of play or stuff we want to use immediately for halftime or uh, post-match. But then at the same time, immediately once the match is done, I'm sending it off to Instat to get further broken down. Um, once we're back and you know our office is looking at the at the match that we just played to prepare for the next morning. And usually from there, within usually 12 to 24 hours, they'll break it down. And from there, I just I grab the data, which I'll use through just coding and Python and parse it within that. And then from there, I send it to a PostgreSQL um, database, which I create and within after Instat, everything else I use is open source to just save money and time, which is valuable um, within college soccer. And then from I send it back from the database back into Python where I can run my models and the different visualizations that I have just through coding that I already have made. I can just do through a, um, just a flip of a button and it's just other or else it's automated. And the other major benefit of this data that I can link it immediately back into video through coding, which at that point with the video and the data, I have it made perfectly to be able to show insights or information to the players and the coaching staff. So Mike, real quick on that. Yeah. Can you just explain? So obviously you, the film's broken down, uh, you know, it's sent to us, we sent it back to you. What is your timetable as a whole uh, to create these visual visualizations? Yeah, um, to create the stuff after data, it's usually, I don't know, 30 minutes, maybe once I can get it uploaded in, I can just, um, once I can run everything back through and connect everything back together, but everything else after that's just automated. So it's just putting the match ID and I'm formulating a match report, um, a PDF match report that I just pull off and I can send off of what we're looking for, whether that's expected goals. Um, and just other so your process is, is very much streamlined, uh, you know, once obviously the game film is obtained by Instat. And like you said, it's that 12 to 18 hour uh, turnaround time. So you're really, you know, once you're, you're finished your, your match, uh, you're getting right to work and you're having, you're able to start working on your next opponent, uh, working on your team as well, correct? Yeah, in general, it's usually right. Uh, we train in the morning and I usually walk off a training, off a training pitch, I can immediately plot my computer and start uh, preparing everything else. Excellent, all right. So now just to give an example of what exactly the data looks like that I'm pulling from the API, uh, this is what it looks like in the JSON, which for a lot of people it just doesn't really look like anything that they can use. And from there, I turn into, just through coding, into a, a more data frame that looks like this, just in um, utilizing pandas in Python, which is a lot, uh, a lot better format that we can utilize through a lot of different forms. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the modeling in Python that I do. So just an overview of these models is, so through the Instat API access, um, I've accessed the past three seasons, as I mentioned, which contains over 6,400 games across those three seasons. Um, here, I'm just gonna quickly highlight some expected goals and expected passes with potential takeaways from those models. Um, and I'll have a more detailed write-up if you wanna check them out later that have been in my blog from the past couple of weeks. Absolutely. Um, so here's just a quick background on expected goals. Um, if you've been here, you probably know what expected goal is, but um, it's just simply the probability of a shot becoming a goal. I run this using a logistic uh, GAM model. Um, and then also with the inside API data, it contains shot location on the goal frame, which then allows me to make a post shot expected goal model as well to just the generic expected goal, which gives extra information that I can give, um, that I can have for myself, give the coaching staff or share with the team as well. So, Mike, on the expected goal, how yeah. how much are you guys relying on that at JMU uh, based on our data that you're pulling from Instat? I mean, when you're doing your pre-planning for the upcoming and the scouting. Yeah. Uh, in general, expected goals can be kind of that, that framework towards all of our analysis where it's looking towards how can we generate the best chances. And then at the same point, we're reviewing the match versus how it actually happened versus just that um, – for lack of a better word, that gut feel that a lot of people will rely off of so we can have a better 
a better knowledge of how the match actually went. Did we did we get a little bit of that unluckiness, or did we did we actually create the the, the best chances that we were we just couldn't convert that day? Are you, are you guys capitalizing on those chances that you're creating, or uh, you know, on luck on your side? Excellent, cool. Exactly. So then this is kind of what the model um, looks like on a pitch. So just a couple things to point out. You can see the different, the different almost zones placed by the, the rings of the colors in it. Um, so where the red is those really, really high chances right inside the six in the gold mouth. And then you're branching off further deep where those even inside the yellow was right on top of the six where it'd be amazing to get chances there. But all in all, this little circle that I just put on the pitch is what we call the goal zone, which to be completely honest, I don't really remember exactly where I got the name from. I know I didn't come up with it, but I took it from somewhere. And that's really the, the, the primary area where goals will come from and where you kind of want to put the ball into. And to sign up with this too, also with the data, I'll look at not only the shots that come within this area, but the entries we get in there, whether controlled or uncontrolled. So that can be from passing, from dribbling the ball into area. It's kind of similar to the way hockey does um, tracking of information where they're looking at um, controlling uncontrolled entries into a certain space to see kind of further up how they're getting there and how they're kind of creating those chances that they might be putting on 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 goal. Ah, okay, that's awesome. So then, similar to this, these next plots will look at different situations of that same type of map. So the one thing I kind of want to point out in each map is how that little the zone shr the zone shrinks um, based on the situation that's occurring. So this is that same kind of map just with the header being a shot. So you can kind of just kind of see where the blue area, the light blue area really, really shrinks and the red area, area is almost non-existent. Um, and that's just because headers are really hard to score, especially the further away you get. Um, so how do you goal. how do you transpire this over to when you're you know sitting down and breaking down video with, with the girls at JMU? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well with, um, and overall with the spectacles, we're looking at how we're making the, the how we're making our chances in, is that necessarily the shot we want to be taking? Um, so that is limiting long distance opportunities instead of creating chances inside that goal zone. Um, with headers, it's different where we don't, we turn that information, but we don't want long crosses kind of outside that general, um, inside the six to maybe eight yards off the byline, where that's kind of the area we want to put the ball and not anywhere further to be heading it because I'm very looking at very, very low chance of scoring. And we just don't want to have those opportunities to, you know, go our way really. Wow, excellent. So this is, a, again, this is from, it's from a cross. Um, this is either, either with your foot or with your header. It didn't let's cut it off by that. The zone is um, a little similar and it shrinks. The yellow zone will shrink a little bit. This map is from a carrier preceded by a dribble that occurs. And you can kind of see how they're, the, it's really similar to the original map um, where it's preceding from a carry. But then you can see that because shots, you, it's really hard to dribble deep inside the penalty area that those are almost non-existent. So, which just makes sense because you don't dribble necessarily always or dribble a lot of chances deep um, into almost where the deep where the goalkeeper may be standing. And yeah, map, sorry, I lost you for a second there. There's a bad storm coming through and I lost, lost everything, but I'm back. Yep, so then this one, this map is looking at situations from a corner kick. Um, and here, this is really the map where we look at how we want to create chances from a corner. Um, uh, kind of just an unselfish plug here as well, that um, through a lot of work that myself and our head coach Josh did on set pieces last year, we were the top, the best team, in the, or one of the best teams in the past three years, um, just working with set pieces. And a lot of it comes back down through where we want to create chances from and how we're creating those. And really just a really basic point is that, is where we could put those, um, those shots from. And that's, you know, that prime area is almost right on top of the six. Um, and even more that's so- a, That's what we highlighted in the, your goal zone. Uh, we could see the, the mapping here. Uh, you know, the red zone's kind of obviously grown a little bigger on your set pieces. And that, you know, of course, goes to how well you guys succeeded in them with Josh. Right, yeah. And the last one is just looking at if it's from a, a service free kick. So if the ball's being, you know, crossed in the box, you know, trying to get on, it, get on the end of it. And there's not there's not necessarily a lot of these that occurs and um, occurs really well, and it's just it's really spotty, but still it's general area. Put it near the six, put it on top of the six, and you know, find the you know create to create the best opportunities. So now these are this next little slide is looking at different factors that come off of the expected goal model. So this is like looking at the distance of the goal. 
Which another thing to note on this is this distance to goal isn't just the yardage off of the end line, but it's also taking into account the angle to the goal um, in the same kind of adjusted distance formula. Oops, go back. And just the thing to note from is how distance just drops. The chance of scoring drops quickly the further you are from goal, um, which you saw in the plots as well. This is looking at the speed of attack and the chance of scoring from it. So uh, in general, the mean speed or the average speed of attack um, in a possession will be around that two to three zone, um, which is kind of that lower spot of yeah, chance of scoring. And as you make your attack quicker, right, almost primarily up to that seven meters per second um, is where you're really increasing your chance of scoring, which you, you can kind of think of those as your quick counterattacks after winning the ball, um, which happens a lot of times off, off of the press and the current um, atmosphere of the game. And the interesting of this is how the graph drops really quickly right after eight meters per second, which I think comes from long balls that teams will just pump up the field and try to put a shot off, which those aren't necessarily helping our chance of scoring, uh, more so it would be dipping your chance of scoring, primarily just by pumping forward. Um, and this map is looking at the number of passes in a possession. And one of the things I'll note later is that a lot of people kind of, one of the first things coaches will say to me when they learn about what's on the next slide of the like three pass or less score a goal, right? Um, where in reality that came from uh, this, this guy who was working in England and was the first guy to really apply data into, into soccer and kind of uh, create a playing style based on information that they're creating. And it's not necessarily right because there's just so many possessions that happen in that short span. So the one thing I have to pull from this is that even though the sequences get longer, it doesn't mean they're necessarily hurting your chance of scoring or more so that those short sequences make their best chance of scoring goal. Um, that's really the best thing to pull from this one. Oh. And hitting on that, the three passes leading the goal is, as I said, Charles Reap is one of the earliest have known, that have earliest known to have used data to impact um, a style of play, which was with Wimbledon, and I forget the other, and, I, and the English FA actually used that as well. And this was just simply, he found that three passes or less leads to goal, which because he was just looking at how many, or how goals were scored and how many passes came before the opportunity. But his process was a little bit flawed. And this was a quote that I pulled from a 538 article that I really liked that is about what analytics can teach us about the beautiful game. And just this, this little article is something I always send to coaches that come up to me right away and ask about this little three passes leading to goal because they kind of think, immediately, all right, that's the side we need to play. I was like, hold on, wait a second. It's not necessarily right. And this is a quote that really shows why that's not necessarily the, the best idea to think about it. And it's just simply, Reap's mistake was to fixate on the percentage of goals generated <clears throat> by passing sequences of various lengths. Instead, he should have flipped things around, focusing on the probability that a given sequence would produce a goal. What that means in layman's terms is just that he's looking at the overall lump percentage of where those are coming. So maybe that's I don't know the actual total, but maybe it's 50% of goals are coming from um, sequencing with three passes or less. Whereas, and instead looking at the, how many sequences are happening, how many goals are them and kind of dividing that, where then you can create that probability of, of how it's occurring. And to kind of further the point of this, of, of why this occurs, is looking at those kind of the sequence lengths. So this little distribution plot is showing passes and possessions with goals. Um, and you can kind of see that peak right around the around three passes leading to that goal, which is going right back to Reap's study how, um, however many years ago. Wow. Same thing with shots that peaks early on of the, sequ of the sequence length leading to uh, a shot occurring. But the reason for this is because of the game we all love to watch is built around short sequences, around short possessions. And this map shows exactly that. This is passes in all possessions. So you can see, um, every possession has occurred in college soccer over the past three seasons. The majority of them are those short sequences, which is the reason, which then is just logical sense of that's where goals are going to be occurring from. And to kind of show that, and some people even will bring up, all right, well, the top teams that even play possession, will they, uh, a more possession playing the ball around style that will impact them and they'll have more sequence lengths that are longer? Well, no, because to kind of further this, this is the kind of top three teams that will play that more. Um, fluid possession style of play. And even these teams, Stanford, UCLA, um, and Penn State, who all play possession brand and style of soccer, um, they all have majority of short sequence lengths in their, in their game, which is 
it just kind of shows that just because that three pass for less has those the biggest percentage of goals happening, that's not necessarily the reason why. And kind of that little percentage chart of looking at the chance of scoring off long possessions is a little bit of signal showing you that um, it's not necessarily the thing to believe in. And um, it's not bad to play more passes. It's not going to hurt your chance of scoring. In fact, it might actually be a signal that having those longer sequences and chances your chance of scoring based on being able to move the defense around and, you know, kind of try to pick apart the back line or draw them out and then play behind them. So then I also mentioned that the API data also allows me to get the location of the goal frame. So this is just a quick output of what the post chat expected goals looks like. Um, so just a couple things to point off from this quick model is, you can, is the red, red and yellow areas would be those higher chance of scoring based on where the shot is placed. And you can kind of quickly see those areas are, are um, pretty obviously the bottom and the top corners of the, of the net um, with almost the middle and even the arm length of the, of the middle of the net, the chance where the goalkeeper is going to save it the most. So it's kind of where you kind of want to can kind of be a guide of where you want to place the shots um, in terms of where you get into the areas. Now, would you take this and kind of, you know, maybe print it out, put it in the locker room, or when you're sitting down doing film studies, is, is this a key point that you would show the girls? We could. I don't necessarily always use this in terms of a hard guide of showing them. Um, more so because I just don't want to – I just don't always want to overload with information, but it's something that we use at least as a coaching staff to guide um, kind of finishing where it just – it's almost like a guide of placement. The one we will use a little bit is this next one, which is just off of penalties. So this is a really interesting one as well um, where – so the average that I've seen across the across the world and professionally with scoring off penalties is around 77%. And the data that I have for college soccer, it came out to around 72%. So this can be almost looked at as a guide is where we can place the penalties to be able to score um, the, the majority of time versus not. And this is even more so the bottom corners, the top corners, or even more so directly ahead of the goalkeeper in the middle, which is a, a little interesting point because not necessarily often thought. And the same thing, even the arm length of the goalkeeper near the post you get is as likely to be saved, um, which I think just comes down to more towards the goalkeeper has to be set right in the, or more often not set right in the middle of the right in the middle of the, the net. So it's less time for them to move to be able to save that opportunity. Um, this is kind of one that we'll use to kind of almost, that we can use to kind of direct where they might want to place penalties or we can even look at the other side of it and seeing where other players are facing, maybe putting their penalties. Just by quickly popping up the map. Yeah, so Can you tailor this for the individual goalie? So like next opponent scouting as well? Yeah, so the one thing that I'll quickly plot and look at will be um, the penalty taker of the next team we're playing. So we can see where they put their penalties in the past, um, however much information have, just we have a little bit more of where that player has placed her um, penalty kicks before and where maybe it'll be a guide to where they uh, will go in the future and something we'll, we'll give to our goalkeeper coach and our goalkeepers uh, to kind of let them dive in, as well as being able to watch the video off them to kind of see if there's any signals in terms of, um, you know, hip direction or anything like that in terms of the direction they're about to go. And then the next couple of slides are just looking at examples of the shot map visualizations I pull off of this data. So the one thing I do off of these shot maps is I combine the kind of the regular just on the pitch expected goal with that post shot expected goal on a single map. These aren't necessarily the ones that I'll show the team or the players every single time, just because it's not necessarily what I want to overload with information, but more so if there's a specific point to pull off of it, like their post shot expected goals higher than their regular expected goal to kind of explain a little bit of difference of maybe why they're scoring more goals than um, we expect them to. That's where I'd kind of put this, this whole visualization in front of. Um, if I wasn't, it would just be the main pitch on the, on the left side of your screen. Um, just so you can see the, where the locations that they're creating shots from. Um, I'll just kind of click through these. The one thing to notice in all these is that uh, these are kind of the top teams across the country the past three years, and they highly outscored their normal expected goals. But if you look at their post shot expected goals, it's a little bit higher to kind of ex help explain a little bit more of the difference. So like BYU here scored 82 goals, and they only expected about 54.7. Uh, and, and then the post-shot goals for at least 71 and a half 
that's a heck of a lot closer than um, just a normal expected goal showed. Third thing that I kind of look at as just principle of analysis before we play the team in opposition is look also looking at the tables that you'll see in the bottom right. You get to see kind of the just the there's three situations where they might be creating opportunities from to see where they're creating their best chances out of. And at the same point off of that, looking at maybe on the map, there's a certain section of the penalty area that they're creating more off of. I don't, I don't, neither, I don't think any of these teams had any, but for example, if a team had a, heart, a large cluster of shots on the edge, on the left edge of the penalty area from deep, maybe I know that their winger likes to cut in and rip shots from there a lot. And that's something we can put into knowledge with the goalkeepers, knowledge of the team to know that we can expect those shots and we know the shots are going to come um, and they'd like to take them a lot. A kind of example of a player that I didn't include in this one, in this presentation, we played a player last season, last season that had 55 shots and didn't score a single goal. And her expected goal wasn't, expected goals weren't really high either because she was taking, I think she had three shots within the penalty area and then the other 52 were outside the penalty area. So, you know, if you're just looking at generic shot-based information, you're going to miss exactly why she's taking 50 plus shots and hasn't scored a goal. Whereas I can kind of put it up in front of, of the, of the uh, coaches and I almost said it laughingly where, oh my gosh, this girl has taken so many shots and hasn't scored and then this is why. And it's something we can expect of more so. She's not necessarily the big threat that other teams might think, um, but it's just something to be aware of. So then this one is looking at Macario, who's probably the best player in the, uh, in the country. And you can see her, her 29 open play goals when only the, the 12.6 again normal. And they can kind of see some more of that reasoning of, all right, maybe um, the reason she's scoring so highly is she's at 20.6 post-shot expected goals, um, which helps explain some more of that difference between why she's scoring. And then just some others, you can see Sophia Smith here. Um, she loves to come off the wing and take shots where you can see that in this map where there's a large cluster, especially on the right side of penalty area, where she where those come, can come from her cutting inside or getting the ball after her run inside and taking a shot. Uh, even if she flips to the left side, it's that similar area just reversed, where she'll play on the right side more so, which that will be key information that we'll take within the team as well to show just a little bit more information about that player and our oppositional analysis. Now, would you take this, this, this with your data, with your own team as well, break down individual players? Yeah, it's something, it's actually feedback that I'll give the players at least every other week in terms of what they created, um, or what the shot map is now, is now looking like. Um, some will come in and look at it or want to see it on their own as well. But I'll at least send it to, give it to them and give them the information um, else. We have one player who's, who is really, really good at creating shots in the goal zone, um, which is just almost instinctual in terms of getting there and she knows how to take shots. And then there's an, another example of a player when I first came in in 2017, yeah, 2017, where she had just had a large cluster of shots on the edge of the penalty area or outside the penalty area where she's just hurting our chance of scoring goals or hurting our overall possessions. Where eventually, once, uh, where eventually that next spring, once our next coaching staff came in, got to kind of teach more so the philosophy of how the goals are scored and how we can create better opportunities. And from there, she upped her goal scoring tally because she got in better positions that next season. Um, the funny thing off that example is that she took the exact same amount of shots um, that she did the previous year, but scored, I think it was three more goals. Um, and it just purely came down to because she was getting in better, um, better areas, which is again, just feedback of these maps that I'll give back to the players looking at those locations where they're taking the shots from. Then here's a map of Viennes um, from South Florida who just got drafted to the um, to New Jersey. And then this one is Ordonez, who's just a freshman at UVA. Um, you can see here, she's pretty decent at getting shots within the goal zone as well, and has large cluster shots right on top of that six, which helps her score you know, the 15 goals she had this past year as a true freshman. And then also uses the kind of look at goalkeepers. So I do it a little bit differently than traditional goalkeeper um, statistics will look like. So the GSAA is looking at its goal saved above average and it's looking at the expected goals, the post shot expected goals allowed minus what she's actually allowing. So here, Emily Boyd in 2017 um, had almost seven and a half goals saved above what we expect an average keeper to kind of give up. And then the, the ASV is adjusted save percentage, which is then again, looking at the expected save percentage or 
yeah, your expected save percentage minus your actual save percentage. Um, and if it's positive, then you're looking at overperform or she's performing, you know, better than we expect. So here she's saved about 10 percentage points more so than um, we expect her to fit her to do based on the shot she was um, protecting against. And here's Katie Lund, who was a big factor for Arkansas having their good season this year up until uh, hitting the NCAA tournament. <clears throat> when you can kind of see within the penalty area, there's a good spattering of yellow shots that didn't go in that she did well to keep out of the net. So here, here's Mandy McGlynn from Virginia Tech, who also was, I think, in my top 10 um, from her 2018 season as well, but I just included her 2019 on here. Um, you can see here, she saved, I mean, she saved three really high chances within the penalty or within the six yard as well. And the last one is just uh, Natalie Grassi from Princeton in 2018. And those were just examples of past goalkeepers, high performing goalkeepers that there have been. So now this next section is looking at expected passing, which um, is based and inspired by some of the work that Devin Pluler, who's the director of analytics with the Toronto FC, has put out where he put a piecewise logistic regression on his GitHub. Um, what he did was he clustered passes um, based on the different location because it's such a big indicator of how passes are completed. So what I did was I looked at, I, did, I ran that model and saw what it looked like, but then I thought I wanted to try to improve the performance of the of it as well, where I took a random forest and inserted the the uh, the clusters as a feature of the model. But the reason why expected passing I look to use is because it's just overall problems with looking at generic pass percentage. As I mentioned, it's one of the, the location of a pass is crucial to the outcome of whether a pass is successful or not. Um, and it's because it just comes down to the 10 yard pass near the edge of your, your attacking penalty area is a completely different pass than the center backs making a 10 yard pass between each other. Um, then off of this, lots of easy passes will then boost your overall completion numbers and make you, you know, look like a 91% passer where you're actually playing passes that are highly likely to be completed over and over and over again. Um, and similar to the last point, the percent can vary based on the position, and even more so how that player is used facing the position. Because a, a center made at one school would be asked to play a lot of line breaking balls, versus another player may be asked to be used more as a connecting player and just kind of retain possession for the team. And, you kind of, and this can kind of be a way to almost identify that point and seeing why this player might be having that high percentage where another player might not. And one of those points that people look at in the professional game is, you know, Trent Alexander Arnold or Kevin De Bruyne. Um, because they have low pass percentage numbers based on we might, what people might think a center mid or a right back should, uh, should be at, but it's because they're creating, you know, they're playing so many high value passes that, that they're pulling so much off for the team. And really the one of the things that I obsess with with the passing, which I won't really touch in this presentation, will be the risk reward of passing, um, which this is kind of a factor in it of the chance of completing a pass. So what those clusters look like and come out to once you run it is just a simple k-means clustering of putting the, the start location, the end location, and a pass, and then finding basically what where they are. So this is about this is 72 different clusters of passes within the data, um, and you just kind of see the different locations where passes come. There's a lot down each touch line. There's a bunch of passes deep in the area, and again, the higher the pitch, different passes to the right and left from the center. Um, anyways, to enter the 18 yard rack, eight of uh, the penalty area through almost the top of the D, slotted balls on the um, inside the area, as well as crossed into the box. So, then similar to expected goals, when we're looking at the factors of the model, is here's the two different factors looking at the, the models for expected passing, where this first one is the angle of the pass, where the big drop in the middle is a pass directly forward and going each right and left is looking at almost passes going backwards as you go around where those backward passes are high you know highly likely to be completed up at near 95 percent the next one is looking at the distance for the length of pass which again it's it's fairly fairly logical the further that your pass attempted the less likely it is, it is to be completed so then this is kind of what the output looks like once you run it and just based on locations on the pitch where you know there's a high chance of completing a pass versus a low chance of completing a pass. And where there's a low chance that are primarily located are the corners of the pitch, as well as once you reach the byline of the penalty area looking for those cutbacks um, is where the red and the yellow are. Um, you can kind of see the, the, 
majority of the center of the pitch or the, even the middle third is highly blue and one the and when I first sent kind of this research, this kind of work to um, coaches, they always send back like, all right, what's the simple thing to pull from it? And I remember my response being, um, well, just overall the college game, so many people think that um, you, it's hard to complete passes or players aren't capable of having a higher quality to complete the passes that, that are involved in this kind of the possessionist style play. We're trying to link passes together when in reality, it's not true because this isn't just looking at the UCLA or the Stanford's or the Penn State's or the UVA's where those teams are the ones that are playing those, those, those more fluid style plays. We're just looking at all teams. So even my, even the players at JMU will complete those passes um, in our own defensive third to link together. Um, we, we still might not be having those longer sequences of the quality where we can have complete fluidity, but even when we were had a little less style play than we, than we necessarily were looking to add on to, there was still, Additive, we want to be we want to have the ball enough to be able to dictate what we want to do. Well, it's link, maybe it's linking just a couple of passes within our own half to be able to dictate what we want to do further the pitch by movement or running off the shoulder player or whatever. And it's just this kind of map just kind of shows that it's more likely than I think some people think in the college game to complete those passes further deep. And this map is probably my even more favorite to show that is you can see the them see the expected pass by each cluster of what the average chance of clean that passes. So you can see here those deep, those passes deep in your half with the blue, the switches between center backs, even once you get up to the mid, to the mid, uh, midfield line, those passes are still high likely to be completed. It's those balls where we're looking to pump forward where it's the chance of completing it uh, goes down a lot. And you can see those passes from your own half, we're looking to pump it forward um, almost in the channel where it's, you know, they're hard to complete. But how would you take this? Um, and, and kind of explain it to your team a little bit. Can you touch on that? Yeah. This we touch on briefly with the team. This is more so we keep with the, the coaching staff, the technical staff, in terms of almost creating um, what we want to occur in a game or principles of play. Um, so like I said, it's, it's kind of a topic where we brought up a couple of years ago. We might not necessarily have the top quality to play the way that UCLA and Stanford and you know those happening that can create those longer possessions of the fluidity. Um, we can take those instances of what we know that some teams might be lacking, of keeping the ball a longer to dictate the play a little more, and put that into our style. And that might be keeping possession a little deeper and putting it between some of our players. Maybe it's a fullback to, to their center back, or just our six linking a little bit more than other, than other teams in our conference may be doing. Just to, just feel those kind of dictate exactly what we want to do. And that might be getting our positioning right with our forward groups or getting our other midfielders, you know, positioned within half spaces, positioned within off the shoulder of players. So we then create, we want to uh, numerical, numerical advantages or other situations that we're looking for um, moving up the pitch. And, you know, some of that might be so, as simple as we want our winger to be looking to run off the, the shoulder of a player to then, you know, create opportunities for throw for through balls to then, you know, be almost clean out on goal and create opportunities with the goalkeeper or just situations like that. Just taking that information more so with the, with the coaching staff to have a more um, influenced uh, principles of our play. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So then this is just a quick snapshot of what those expected pass values look like kind of in a video format, where if you look at the bottom left, you'll kind of see what that value is. And here you get one from with going inside with a little bit of pressure. Um, you get one going backwards, high chance of completing. And here you get a cross deep in the area, not likely to be, not likely to be completed. Big switch. Another kind of back, not a lot of pressure, all the way back to the goalkeeper. Really unlikely to be completed. And these next two are, you know, really low chance to be completed, but then there's high risk, there's high reward passes. And this right. one leads to a goal. Same here. Lower chance, but that does have a higher reward. Which that's where I really love from passing, looking at where you can create those, those reward scenarios from. So when we can look at the kind of create a metric using expected passing, it's just called expected pass rating. Um, which is just simply your passes that you complete divided by the expected passes complete. 
Um, and it's just a metric to see how the player or the player is performing relative to the expectation. Or below one is the person's performing you know, a little less than average, one's performing um, where we'd expect them to, and above one, I mean, they're performing higher than the average um, as we'd expect. Where then we can use this XPR to judge player performance through the difficulty and passes, difficulty of passing the execution of those passes. It kind of just looks like in a table is this, and you can see on the far right, it's just that generic pass percent number. And you look at the, the column directly to the left of that, is the average pass difficulty of those players. So just the one, I, the player I kind of want to point out from this is uh, Naomi Germa from Stanford. You can kind of see in 2018 and 2019, where you look in 20, in 2019, her pass percent is so much, is about two percentage points higher than it was in 2018 at around 91 versus 89% in 2018. But if you look at maybe why that happened, it's because her, her average pass difficulty went, um, had she played easier passes that season. So she completed 91%, but her, um, average difficulty went to almost 80 versus being around 70, 76. The, the other thing to kind of, I look at when I look through these kind of tables is uh, that hits my eye quickly is Alex Loroff. I probably butchered that last, butchered that last name, but from Santa Clara, the second on that table where she completed almost 80% of her passes, but only expected to complete 68% of them. So it's a player that I would kind of look into of why that's happening or, you know, is that quality that much higher that she, you know, is so good at completing those um, the passes she's attempting? Or is there outside factors? Maybe it's the quality of the competition or something else like that. Um, but it's kind of, it can also be used as a guide to look at, all right, now time to dive deeper inside, into seeing, you know, why is it occurring? Um, so would maybe, you take that, um, you know, if uh, Naomi was on the transfer portal, um, or sorry, uh, Alex was, would you take that and then, kind of transfer over to Instat and see and dive into more depth of, you know, is this player becoming a standout star? Yeah. I usually the first thing I do, if I see, usually if I uh, fly through any plots or data frames or anything of, and I see something that kind of pops up like that, the first thing I usually do is log on and see why it's occurring or downloading video, just looking at it on the platform and just generically looking at a couple of instances and seeing, okay, this is interesting. Why is this happening? So yes, that would usually be what I would do. Cool. Excellent. So then after going through these models, um, a little more practical examples of how I then further the use of implementing this data into an actual format where we can further aid analysis into a really strong process. And the first one I'm gonna to touch on is using the, the past clustering from that with the past model to find past tendencies in teams. So I first saw this um, from American Soccer Analysis, um, which was by Elliot McKinley, and I, th and I think it was, I forget who the second person was in the article. Um, but they use Z-score to filter passes by the most and least played um, that a team may be doing. So what this will do is it can aid in your oppositional analysis um, just by just kind of showing what a team is playing more so or not versus everyone else. And then it's going to help prepare kind of uh, the coaching staff to know what the other team is going to do, where we can set our team up in training to see those situations um, that our next opponent may be doing um, just to better prepare for what they're going to, what we may be facing. And the flip side of this as well, if we can see what we're doing, um, where this can possibly identify if we're playing a lot of passes that have a low value, or even if we're playing a lot of passes that we're not necessarily wanting our team to make, but we're making a lot of passes that go against our principles of play that go against our game model. So we can kind of, see where those are occurring and possibly formulate a plan to stop those from happening. So now what this kind of visualization looks like, I put it on a map where the blue area, the blue arrows will be those passive teams playing more, um, the overplayed or not necessarily overplayed, but overrepresented versus everyone else. And the red, if there's a red arrow, it means they're not playing those passes really. Um, the one thing I did a little different in this map than I, other people I've seen do a similar thing is I put a heat map underneath it of just the location of all passes, um, which really just came as something as when I was starting to make this from, um, from actually Josh, my coach, or the coach I work with, because um, it's just a point where it's kind of, all right, well, maybe they're missing out on that, that, um, that hard deadline of, you know, of the Z score where it might be not showing a necessary pass type, but they're playing a pass in front location. So like, all right, that's an easy fix. I can throw in the, the heat map of the pass and seeing where they're coming from, which just off that point as well, just almost everything I do 
from the visualization standpoint is kind of looking at how I can tailor it toward tailor it towards what a coach or a player, whoever I'm showing the information for, because that's really what's most important, how they're going to read the information, how they're going to obtain the information. So even something as simple as that, if we go back to the, the shot maps I was making, the, even if something, a detail such as the, the font type that was on those shot maps were made just because everyone ended up liking that, that font type. I don't know. Maybe it was just a little different than a generic, you know, Times New Roman type of font. It might be even such as symbols, maybe it catches their eye for five extra seconds and they pull some of the extra information I want them to pull off of, of you know, or, you know, the, the, the next thing we're going to play Hofstra, maybe they're, uh, they pull off a little more information in terms of where they're creating chances from, whether it be from set pieces, whether it be from open play, but they're really, really good on the counter. And it just kind of almost ingrains the information a little more so. But now moving back to this, so you can kind of see from these first two, this is North Carolina in 18. Um, so they're known for kind of a high energetic pressing style of, style of play. They win the, want to win the ball in the attacking half and play there. And you kind of see how their style didn't really play, change from 18 to 19. It's fairly similar. Um, they, were in that, they were in the championship game each year. Um, they won the ball, played the ball in the area, and focused the ball again at the box to create um, goal scoring opportunities. And we move on. So this is one of my favorite ones to look at because it's just it's kind of indicative of what they do, where the red areas are deep in the of, are deep in their own attacking half, and then they focus the ball on being um, fairly direct. This season was more so generated on their left side to move the ball forward and then create goal scoring opportunities from that left side. Um, this is Arizona, and it's fairly indicative of what they tried to do that year. Um, here's us, just to throw um, us in as well. So maybe if other schools saw it, didn't think I was just putting all their information out there. Uh, us this past year didn't necessarily have what we needed to in the middle of the field, so we couldn't create as much as we wanted to, but focus on getting play kind of wider in the half space and creating opportunities for those areas. Um, and then of course, getting the ball into the goal zone. And this is looking at UCLA in 2019 or this past season. And you kind of see the big, the big red area going up pitch. They don't play direct balls from deep. Um, same thing, they don't play direct ball into the wing. A lot of short, kind of short passes, the switch from basically with that center back area. And this pass going almost primarily up that left wing. Um, you, if you kind of look at that UCLA map, I'm going to pop up a video of, of their, those past clusters from their championship game or the semifinal game. And you can kind of just see those passes occurring. So here's that video. It's to strike early and they have done it, scoring the first 10 minutes. And then there's a pass back to the goalkeeper. Madison Haley. Pass from going inside. Fleming and Rodriguez will reset. And the half space from deep. And so maybe on their way out, but are still playing pretty darn well. And the pass from the half space from deep. Mm -hmm. Really, so breaking ball center back. So, this is really, I use the way to quickly find the passage from the playing because I have a little bit more information before diving even more so into the team. Um, it just gives really clear kind of examples of what this team might be doing so I can prepare. First off, the coaching staff that we're going to be facing. Um, and then after that, we can look at how to present the information to the team. So this is where you get into kind of taking your data and using it to help pre-scout your opponents and kind of uh, compile your game plan. Exactly, yeah. Now, are you showing this to your players or is this just staying within the coaching staff? Uh, usually, I don't put put this kind of video to the team. Usually, we present the information to the team in terms of possession-based. So it's looking at their entire sequence. Um, but this this one's just kind of this one's just primarily just showing those passes. Um, this will either be if it's really something interesting, then I'll take the complete video, take um, example pass to the coaching staff. A lot of times I'll use it internally to then generate more so of exactly kind of how to formulate what they're going to do. Um, yeah, the the map is something we show a bunch of the team, the visualization, just to kind of show what they might be doing. Um, something the coaching staff likes to look at because they can almost kind of formulate their patterns what, what the team might be doing. Same known as past networks. So this visualization, along with past networks, are usually one of the first two things I look at when I start preparing oppositional analysis. And it's just a really nice, almost like a guide or a framework of what a team uh, is going to be looked to do. So moving out of the clusters is into kind of how I formulate a phase of play sort of framework out of the data and a quick background of the phase of play stuff. 
that's inspired by a Leicester City presentation um, back in an Opti Pro forum in 2017, where they use raw data to find, build, progress, and create phases within their attacking organized um, shape. And this was more so based on how they would um, use it to help their oppositional analysis. So what I took this and did was kind of doing that same kind of idea and then also put it into past networks and create a direct link um, to the video. So I can find those sequences of how a team's start, starting their attack and then how they move the ball forward, how they create their or finish their attacks. Now what that is. So I'll let the GIF kind of run as I talk through it. So you can see kind of in that top left GIF, the, the areas overlap and it's completely on purpose. <clears throat> it, the areas probably even overlap a little more so than that GIF shows because I don't just want it to be by thirds. Um, I want it to be a little more so than that because everyone has their attack a little differently. It's not you know just a hard hard yes or no what the team's doing. So you can kind of see in the established phase, it's is what people generally generally think of as their attacking third or their defensive third um, in their build up. But I include a stipulation that if the pass is greater than or equal to the eighty five percent or more expected passing, and the reasoning for that because I want to be able to take into account for teams that maybe wing the ball higher and playing the ball backwards to start their attack or start establishing what they want to dictate in the next phase of play. An example of that would be the UCLA's, the Stanford's, the Penn State's, the UVA's, those teams that play that, that possession-based style, that fluid style, where they're, they're first when they, win the, when they win the ball to set their attack um, and not necessarily just to go forward or pump the ball forward like other teams will do. And it's just a, a nice way to add a different um, element to that phase. The next phase is um, evolve, what Lester called their progression phase. Um, and this is just originating in that next area up the pitch. And it also triggered on if the pass, if the completed pass is a progressive pass. So when I define a progressive pass is if the pass is moved 25% or more towards the, the opposition, towards the opposition goal. Um, just know, it's basically what happens is just a nice trigger um, besides just happening in that area to see how they're starting to move the ball into their next phase. Then the final phase just simply passes into or originating um, that final area, which you can kind of get a, dic a dictation of how they're creating attacks of getting into that space or how they're creating attacks um, while already into that area. On the same side of that, I also have a direct phase of play, which is simply if a pass occurs that it's greater than or equal to 35 yards. And I also label each of those in my um, XML export, whether it's dynamic or not, which is if it's less than a second and a half seconds per pass, which I believe was around the 75th percentile of how fast attacks um, may move. Um, so then the first outcome of this is looking at past networks. I'll just pop all three up. So this is past, net past networks by each phase that occurs. Um, so this is from our semifinal from two years ago versus um, College of Charleston. And you gotta see here our, um, our kind of our play this year is looking more get forward um, to create opportunities more so than keeping the ball. We just didn't have the necessarily the ability or the need to do it. Um, you're going to see in that in the first established pass network, we look to get the ball um, particularly wide on that right-hand side or directly forward to where you can see Haley Crawford poaching high, which will be his direct ball. It's mainly looking, and this game is a lot of running off that right back shoulder. Um, in the evolved phase, you can then kind of see how we move the ball up the pitch or progress the ball forward, which here is a lot centered within that right center back side, where it's moving into that right mid, and then more so our right forward, which is Claire there, came dropping down into the almost like half space ish area deep, where that's how it kind of got the ball into that space. Then you can see in our um, in our final phase, the innervate phase, of how we're creating chances inside that. Uh, area where we want to start creating opportunities of getting involved into the goal into the goal zone. And it's similar to the ball phase that came from this match within that right sided with the right center back to the right mid to the to the to the right wing um, from Hannah to Steph and to Claire. Which these can uh, this is a simple view by match. I can break it down. I usually populate these matches uh, by their last three by their each phase. Then I'll also do the whole season, which will be Here's just an example of Stanford. I mean, they have a, a lot more clear pass number than we did in that game. So a lot more structured in this past season than we played in 20 in 2018. You can see in their established phase, there are two center backs playing ball a lot uh, between each other, as well as linking in to the fullbacks, um, as well as one of their six coming down with Wesley. As they move up the pitch in their evolve phase, they still keep the circulation along the back line, but then you can see Pickett is primarily the one who moves the ball forward. Um, 
There's another sign with Pickett, what I see from going to data. She, she really evolved this past year and being one of their main ways to progress the ball forward for Stanford. Um, she's just an interesting point that you can get in and see through this evolved phase. So here, Pickett's moving the ball a lot inside of Macario, dropping a little deeper, as well as Haley being in the middle of pitch. Um, then that left side is a little with their left back and uh, Jerma also moving the ball inside the six or the midfielders. In the innovate phase, you can see Pickett again is highly evolved, this time a little less going to Haley than she was in the evolved phase and a lot more going towards Macario, which you can, if you kind of look at the, if you look at the innovate phase, there's definitely one of those in this next video I have where the ball goes wide to Pickett, she serves in and they create a chance because of it. Um, and you can see, and so it's, yeah, the next slide will be a video looking at all these and kind of these patterns. The way I kind of present this information to the coaching staff as well as the team will be, we show kind of the past networks on the slide before looking at the video as a way to kind of pre-guide um, the, the, the patterns we're looking for them to kind of gather in their brain or the pattern we're trying to prepare them for. Um, so if this was, if I was putting together the, the analysis on Stanford to be looking at the evolve phase primarily especially looking at how they're progressing it through Pickett. We're looking at the innovate phase and looking at those, that pattern of how she's moving inside the Macario. And then the slide right after that, which is this, we'll see these phases, and then kind of, I'll tell them, to, you know, look at that, look at those, those, those the, high, the high frequency, the arrows, which are the paths they're completing the most, and you'll see them highly played out. You're building a visualization. Uh, yeah. You're showing them the mapping and then we're taking it right to live video, or sorry, not live video, but a replay of these Six. actions. Out of the gates. It'll be interesting as well. Yeah, just trying to hit to watch them adjust, all the different learning styles, formation. trying to keep it almost player centric or coach centric, and how that information can be gathered by each one. You saw there, there's a circulation along the back line. Um, they didn't necessarily get the progression they wanted, then reset it to move backwards, still inside their, their first phase. Try to play and more circulation. There's David moving to pick it. Here's Pickett on the right side going forward. You're watching black and white television. You know, every night. Here we go. But also, you know, you look at a little bit of circulation start the attack. So that would have been almost like an establishing phase. But right there, it's triggering into their next phase, the progression of their evolved phase. But then again, didn't necessarily get what they wanted and back a little bit. And this is all just information that's gathered kind of within that attacking organized space um, within the kind of four things that happen within attack, defend, attacking transition, defense, and transition. So that where normally you see a kind of Ronaldinho-esque with a no look where you want to play, that deception needs to be added a little bit. That's when you know they're playing. Santa Barbara. There we go. And then here's the uh, two clips of their final phase, uh, the last of which will be a goal scoring opportunity for them, which they have to convert. But there's one, there's Pickett serving, uh, yeah, Pickett put, putting the ball into Haley, which is one of those connections on the past network. They didn't come off, they got it back, circulated it. Two lines of four, you got three up top that are trying to get on the ball. Possession numbers are high. For Stanford again, it's again it goes wide to Pickett. Again, moves it forward to Haley. slowing down and looking for the right. Link up. Haley, now wide to Kennedy Wesley, the freshman in Al Macario. Haley. Now just trying to circulate it around the top of the penalty and create. Briefly to change the point of attack, the California Cabal scores. Now in this clip, you'll see when the goals are created. Katarina Macario. And it comes from this ball going to find Pickett. Looking to add on to her season two. Pickett eventually gets it. And Kiki Pickett continuing to fly down that blank. Pickett. Colasso. And then they created the goal, which came from one of those patterns we saw in the past network, the ball coming to pick it, picking and doing the creation from wide. Um, so you can, we can really see here how you translate this data uh, and you bring it right to video. Um, and you're having good success, obviously, at JMU with kind of teaching all and touching on all the learning basics for the coaches and players. Yeah. I mean, like I said, every um, the the primary motive for me is just making their – making their life easier to make better decisions. And that might be something as simple, or I say this is simple, but it's just, it's trying to hit all those different areas that I might be able to, to hit with information. And the key for me is as much as I do with data, there's as much work, if not more, putting into that video process. Um, and the, vi the video is just the best way to communicate the information because it's, it's the language I can speak directly with the coaches as well as also having a little bit of background in coaching. Um, and I can put the wordage, the verbiage of kind of what we're looking for into it. And this is also a, the way that I can train the information to players on the same template of showing the networks where it's been 
uh, I think this little phase of play thing has been the most the most impactful thing I've done at JMU with this with the data because it's it's a nice way to guide the opposition analysis, a nice way to translate the information to the first the coaching staff and then the team, and just create a nice a really really nice link of what a team might be doing and how we can prepare our team, and just so we know just so we can be as knowledgeable as we possibly can um, towards our next match. Um, but yeah, so then just a quick wrap up would be that the data, as I kind of said, the data isn't just for applying and looking through numbers or data frames or simple bar plots or scatter plots, or to be honest, I'm not even the biggest fan of looking at that kind of stuff. Um, or even at the same stand, it's not even just for creating visualizations. It's for finding those insights, finding those insights that then put into a language and to, to impact the decision-making within your program. We're gonna uh, improve the decision-making within the club. Um, and one of the best usages of this is to be able to pull insights from the data and create a direct link into the video um, to show ideas, to show insights, and at the same time, aid in that analysis process, whether it's oppositional, whether it's player, whether it's within your own team. And it's it's just, it's, an, it's the great process to do. And the one thing that I also love with data, which I, which I think more people should get along with, is that the access to this sort of data can be used to speed the time of finding same information that you would do to um, when you purely just go through video and do it yourself. An example of this, it'd be like finding path directions um, for a, finding path directions in a team or player. And the way that just looks like is like a path sonar. So I cut the team off on purpose, but you can kind of see here that the they have a lot more progression, more so on their right-sided center back zone um, from deep in their own attacking half versus on their left side, they're going almost horizontal constantly. Um, and it's something that we look at, I take and almost look at, all right, I pop it up, populate it in the video and see why it's occurring. If there's, if there's an external reason why it's occurring, well, maybe that's what their principles of play are. So then it gives us a link in terms of maybe formulate a pressing strategy um, to how we want to formulate, how, how we're going to defend this team, how we're going to press this team. And after that, how we're going to use pressing to then create chances. Um, but yeah, but the example that just came, I saw something earlier where it was, I think it was Marcelo Bielsa, where they look at like when a player gets the ball in the zone, where they're going to pass it, you know, right, left, forward, whatever. And I can, you know, it might take hours to look through a couple of matches and do it. And I can do it in, you know, five minutes or a touch of a touch of a button um, by looking at a pass sonar. And it's um, that's it's just so many different ways that data can impact your overall workflow within a team. Um, and again, and it's just it's a great process to be able to apply. Absolutely. I mean, you're what you do here is amazing. Uh, the data you're able to compile, uh, and each way you're kind of a little centricate it. Um, and, you know, kind of tailor it to, you know, how a play develops from the back end all the way up into the attacking phases is great. Definitely, yeah. So. Yeah, from there, um, any questions? And the other thing I'll be saying, um, you know, you can follow my WSOCVIS Twitter page or visit the website where I put some blogs up using this kind of, this data. But yeah, from there, um, Dave, any questions from uh, anywhere? From YouTube? No, we had a... Uh... No, no questions. Um, but Mike, I do want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, this is really amazing work you're compiling. Uh, once again, with the Instat API data, we're able you're able to get off from us. Um, and like I said before, we you can use this data from uh, all the way at the academy level, all the way up to the professionals. You know, this is how we do each and every game. Uh, so once again, thanks to you to Mike. Uh, please check out his Twitter. Um, and if there's any questions, please feel to reach out to us here at Instat. So, Mike, have a good day. It was a pleasure. And uh, I'll see you.